May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Let's, uh, let's stand, actually, getting ready to worship God this morning. Let's stand, and uh, just before we actually sing, we're just going to close our eyes and say uh, a little prayer, and we say, Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can actively come together to worship you on this Sunday. We thank you that we join with churches, not just in this nation, but across the nations to bring you praise and to bring your glory. May your spirit now guide us and lead us as we worship, as we engage with your word, and as we seek to be equipped to be your disciples in the week ahead. Thank you that you draw us here, whether we uh, uh, feel we've done really well this week or whether we feel we've really messed up. It's irrelevant in that sense because you love us and you love us hugely and amazingly. Thank you for all you've done for us in Jesus. Thank you that today we come before you because of Jesus and we can worship you in spirit and in truth. So may you guide us now together in Jesus' name. Let's worship God together.
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the
what can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done all my words could not tell not even in part of the dead of love that is old by this thankful Deserve my every breath, for you've paid the great cost, given up the life of death, even death on a cross. You took all my shame away, there defeated my sin, opened up the gates of hell, and the beckon me in. Jesus, what can Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? What can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Not even in part of the dead of love that is old, of the dead of love that is old, of the dead of love that is old, by this thankful. Would you like to take your seats? We're going to go to our story in just a moment, after which our children and young people are going to be heading out to the separate groups. Our story today is Acts 23, verses 23 to 27, if I'm reading that right, and it's brought to us by Christine and the Irvin family, and we're going there now. Previously in the Acts of the Apostles, 
Paul had been at the temple in Jerusalem when a bunch of Jews grabbed him and tried to kill him. The commander of the Roman troops managed to rescue him and then arrested him for good measure. Paul almost got flogged, he got released. There were some speeches that caused arguments, he got arrested for his own good and finally the commander found out there was a plot to kill Paul. And now the continuation. The commander of the Roman troops had to do something. He needed to get rid of the problem that was Paul. So that night, the commander sent Paul to Caesarea to see the governor Felix, not the cat. To make sure that Paul got there safely, he sent him with some troops. No less than 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. He gave them a letter to hand over to the governor, who read... Dear Excellency Governor Felix, the Jews were going to kill this man and I saved him. It turns out they don't like him because he is not behaving like they say their law tells them to. But between you and me, I cannot see why they want him dead. Live and let live, I say. This lot, however, still plans on killing him. I am so clever, I found out their secret plans and I've rescued him once again. I know that you are really wise, so I am sending him to you. I've told your, the Jews to come and talk to you about him. Your fan, Claudius. When the governor had finished reading the letter, he put Paul under guard in Herod's palace until the Jews could arrive. This they did five days later, taking with them a lawyer. They met with the governor Felix and presented their case. A oh, wonderful governor, a oh, ruler of straight lines. We think you are great and oh so clever. I know that when you talk to this rascal, this ringleader of weirdos, you will realise what a troublemaker he is and sort him out. Then came the turn for Paul to speak. I trust your judgment, sir, so I shall talk. I've done nothing wrong and these men cannot even say exactly what bad thing I've done. I did, because I didn't do anything. It is true that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. To rest my case, my conscience is clear before God and man. What was Governor Felix to do? He ummed and he ahed and decided to wait until the good old commander of the troops, Claudius, came. So back under guard went Paul, but at least he was allowed to see his friends. A few days later, Felix sent for Paul again, but when Paul started to talk about being right with God, about self-control and about judgment, Felix got scared and didn't want to listen anymore, so he sent him away. This way, he kept calling for Paul and then sending him away for two years until he stopped being governor. Meanwhile, Paul was left in prison. To be continued. fantastic those of you who are going out to uh, Sunday Club and to other groups if you want to go out there just now that would be fantastic So uh, we're continuing our journey with the Apostle Paul this morning, and uh, today we might be thinking about faith on trial. Paul has his faith and his actions questioned, indeed imposed, by the Jewish leaders, and as a result, he's arrested and forced to explain both what he's up to and why he believes that God has called him to this particular set of actions. wonder if you've ever looked at something and thought, that's not right, is it? It's, there's just something not quite right about it. It's a, perhaps a normal situation, and you look at it and you think, mm, that's just not right. I don't know if you remember last weekend. It feels such a long time ago, doesn't it? But last weekend, many of us were sitting here very, very tired, but uh, we had Mark with us, and Mark likes his food, especially Curry, how could you possibly forget that? There was no way we could, uh, could forget that. And there's no way, uh, I think most of us, and particularly myself, could compete with Mark when it comes to his love for curry. And uh, not everyone likes curry. I know some of you confessed to me you didn't particularly like curry, but you still came to the curry night last Saturday, which I think deserves a special commendation, to be honest. If you don't like curry, you came to a curry night. That is particularly amazing. Uh, what about foods? 
What about other foods? What about pizza? What's the right sort of topping for pizza? Um, I suspect most of us would be fairly conservative and go for a, a cheese and tomato topping. That's fairly safe. Maybe a bit of pepperoni on top, yeah, or uh, in my case, because vegetarian pepperoni, which is acceptable-ish. Uh, what about the following toppings, though, that I found? Uh, Greek pizza. That's not right, is it? That's just not right. That's pizza, but done wrong. Not right. What about Mexican pizza? And if you disagree with me, you can have a chat with me afterwards. But in my view, I don't think that's right, does it? It just doesn't sound right. Uh, what about chicken tikka masala pizza? No, no, I mean, that's just not right, is it? I mean, who would eat a curry pizza? Actually, I think we might know somebody <laughs> from Bradford who might possibly. Anyway, it's not right, is it? So uh, what about uh, away from foods? It's been a little while since I've uh, been up here, so it's a little while since you've heard me talk about dogs. Um, what about this dog? This is a Bedlington Terrier, a small terrier from England that is known for its remarkable resemblance to... Hmm, I can't really think of what it's resembling there. Anyway, that's not right, is it? That's a dog whose bar is far worse than its bark. Uh, away from food and dogs, what about musical instruments? We had a lot of musical instruments up here this morning. Here is a picture of the singing, ringing tree, which is uh, in the Pennine Hills. It consists of pipes with holes through which the wind blows, making a musical noise. Now, that's, that's just not right, is it? That's not right, is it? That's not right, is it? How we, we have in our minds the image of how something should be done. So we have a particular image of pizza, and when someone goes and completely changes the idea, we think, well, that's not right. We have an image of how a dog should look, and if it looks completely different, we think, that's not right, or how a musical instrument looks, that's not right. What about our faith? Do we have in mind a particular way of how it should be lived out, and if it's not, we think, well, that's not right. This morning, Paul comes into a context where people had for a long time Nearly 2,000 years, been worshipping God in a particular way. Jerusalem was the center of their worship. And he comes along and effectively tells them, here's a new way of following God through his son, our Savior Jesus Christ. People looked at it. They could see things that were familiar. It had a familiar shape. But as far as they were concerned, it's not right. Is it? It's just not right, what Paul is saying. We've been reading and working our way through the book of Acts over the past few weeks. It was a book that was written by a friend of Jesus called Luke. He wanted to set out a, an ordinary account of what had happened. And so in the Gospel of Luke, we got Jesus' life and his death, and then it stops part, just about his resurrection. And then in the book of Acts, we continue post-resurrection. Jesus ascends to heaven, and then the early church. How does it begin? Well, Luke sets out in his account of how the church of Jesus Christ begins, the church, of course, that we're part of Today, it's action-packed. There is a lot going on, and a lot centers on the work and the journeys of a person called Paul. We know that Paul had a famous direct encounter with Jesus when he was on the way from Jerusalem to Damascus. Very uh, definite encounter with Jesus that Paul recounts over a number of other occasions. Before he followed Jesus, Paul was a respectful member of society, highly thought of. He was a Pharisee, a religious leader with a great deal of power, and a great deal of authority, and a great deal of respect. We might wonder why he gave all that up to effectively become an outsider, to go someone who would get into all sorts of trouble. We've already read how he's had his life threatened, he's been beaten, he's been imprisoned, and things today aren't going terribly well either, if we're honest. Why put yourself through all this? Well, as far as Paul was concerned, he was doing this because Jesus was his Lord and Savior. Jesus had forgiven him, and if he had to tell this good news, because it wasn't just good news for Paul, it was good news for a hurting, broken world. So see, as we go through our reading today, Paul is accused of, well, what? stirring trouble, being a troublemaker. And, you know, we might just want to look around today and wonder if there's any troublemakers in our church. Usually, we think a troublemaker is someone we really ought to either avoid or, you know, gently push out. But actually, we should be a church of troublemakers if we are following our Lord, who was also a troublemaker, and servants like Paul. As followers of Jesus, are we known for being troublemakers? People who 
stir up riots? Or is our faith so meek and mild that actually we're more likely to bore people than frighten people or upset them? As Brooke records these events, we've got to remember he's not trying to elevate Paul to some sort of special status. It's a little unfortunate, isn't it, that we call Paul St. Paul, because that makes him sound like he's completely different, unattainable to us. His story is unique to Paul, that's true. But his faith in Jesus is for everyone to discover. And therefore, Luke is not trying to set Paul up as uh, someone who we just admire, a superhero who we can't ever get near, but rather he's trying to say, do you know, your faith ought to be incorporating elements of this as well. There ought to be times when we're causing people upset because of Jesus Christ. There ought to be times we're getting into trouble because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We're not called to be respectable members of society, not a society that's broken and turns its way against God. We're called to cause trouble until such time as that society repents and truly seeks Jesus. We're very guilty, I think, I'm speaking only for myself here, of dampening down the fire of God. His Spirit comes, we pray, Holy Spirit come, it comes, and then we realize it's going to get us into trouble, and we get frightened, and we think, oh, it's much easier if I just stay a bit, bit quieter. It's much easier if I just play along. Paul couldn't do that, and we shouldn't do that. God had great plans for Paul, and God has great plans this morning for each of us here if we will let him. Well, let's get back to uh, where we are in our journey as we've uh, been here over the past few weeks. Paul has been journeying towards Jerusalem. Uh, We've seen, hopefully you can remember this, that he was really determined to get to Jerusalem. He was someone who would not be put off going to Jerusalem. Uh, So what happens when Paul finally and faithfully reaches that destination? He steps out in faith. He travels to Jerusalem He ignores the advice of his friends and still travels to Jerusalem. Friends who warned that there was going to be serious trouble for Paul if he turned up in Jerusalem. How does God reward the faithfulness of his servant? Well, we're told Paul arrives in Jerusalem and within a few days he's seized by opponents who are about to kill him. Only arrest by the Roman authorities saves his life. Now, I don't know about you, but as I'm reading this and as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, that's not right, is it? Surely, if we step out in faith, surely if we follow Jesus and surely if we cause a bit of trouble for Jesus, God will step in and he will reward his faithful servants. It doesn't seem to be the case, at least in the short term. It looks like the long-term reward is there, but in the short time, life looks pretty difficult if we're going to faithfully follow Jesus. In the book of Acts, there are two forces at work. And they're represented by Jerusalem and by Rome. Probably two greatest cities that we would know of from that ancient period. Rome is uh, well known. Nobody disputes that there was a Roman Empire, that it existed, that at its height it covered three million square miles, most of the Mediterranean area that it brought with it roads and laws and a civilization that likes of which had never really been seen before in that period. And then there's Jerusalem. Again, few would dispute that Jerusalem exists because it still exists today with a history and a tradition of faith stretching 2,000 years back to Abraham. In Acts, Jerusalem represents more than a great city. It increasingly represents the old way of doing things. Here in Acts, Jerusalem represents the place where people are kind of stuck with the old way of worshiping God. So stuck are they in the past that they can't see any way that anyone could do things differently. They thought they knew God. They thought that the way to worship God was neatly prescribed traditions and rules and regulations. The idea that anyone dare suggest things could be done differently was increasingly opposed. I wonder sometimes, and we can, I can be guilty of this, let's face it, as a church leader, that we get very stuck in particular ways of relating to God. We think it's got to be done this way because it's only ever been done this way and it only ever will be done this way. And God tries to do a new thing and we've become so attached to the past that we're brittle and God struggles to get through. In Jerusalem, Paul faces these charges from the religious. They are resistant to change. 
And we know the pattern because we see it all too often in our world today. When there's resistance to change, it becomes prejudice. And when it becomes prejudgment about what change could mean, there becomes violence alongside it. There are those in Jerusalem who are so intent on keeping the old ways, they are bitterly opposed to the messenger and the message about Jesus. That's Jerusalem. We remember that in the New Testament, when we go to the Gospels and the stories about Jesus, it's offered those who thought they were closest to God who turn out to be furthest away from the Son of God. There's some warnings there for us. That's Jerusalem, the old ways, the traditions, the brutalness that could not accept God was doing a new thing through Jesus. Then on the other side, there's the Romans. And in a sense, we look at the Romans and how they play out in Acts, and we think, that's just not right, is it? Surely the Romans are the enemies. Isn't it, after all, the Romans who crucified Jesus? And if you've crucified Jesus, that makes you surely an enemy of Jesus? And yet in Acts, again and again, it's the Romans who are portrayed as open-minded, prepared to give Paul and others a fair hearing. In Acts, it's the Romans who sought to maintain their version of law and justice and order. And in Acts, four times it's the Romans who rescue Paul from death either by lynching or by murder. Doesn't seem right, does it? Surely it should have been the opposite way around. Surely it should have been those closest to God who were embracing rescuing, trying to give Paul a fair hearing so they could take on board what he was saying about Jesus. There is a danger of being religious, isn't there? Many of us, I include myself here, want to protect God. And in the process, we can end up silencing the good news about Jesus, God's only son. And it's the Romans, the world, if you like, who step in again and again to save God's servant. I think it's a reminder for me as we kind of do this little study that the world is not always our enemy. Are there ways in which the world today may actually be helping the spread of the good news about Jesus, even in our culture, even in our difficult times? Well, there is. I'm sure you could think of other examples. I just picked out a few. Maybe you could think about how's the world helping us technology? Think about how easy it is today to make contact with Christians or other peoples from other parts of the world Really, really easy. We don't even have to leave our homes. Uh, Internet, technology, we're able to spread the message of Jesus virally really, really easily. There's, of course, travel. Pretty easy, even in uh, slightly restricted, expensive times to get from one side of the earth to another very cheaply or relatively cheaply. Certainly, you don't have to go away for weeks. Certainly, when you go off to a foreign country, you shouldn't be saying goodbye to your family permanently, necessarily. The world has shrunk. Some call it a global village, a fractious global village, maybe, but Nonetheless, relatively easy to spread the message of Jesus compared to what it has been. Never before have there been so many easy ways to pray for one another, to encourage one another in our day-to-day living for Jesus. Not everything about the world is good. Rome had its problems. And we know that in early Christian history, Rome would be a deadly place for many early followers of Jesus. But it's not always all bad. So what bits of the world are we to embrace and use? And what bits are we to avoid? Let's get back to Paul's story. Paul's put on trial before Felix. Loved the story there, guys. Brilliant. And I too had thought, the name I was thinking for Felix is a cat. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Tertullus presents the case against Paul, the lawyer. He's charged with uh, being a troublemaker, ring reader of lights, and a terrorist bent on destroying even the temple. This is not looking good, is it? And we think, well, that, that's just not right, is it? Paul's given them the opportunity to defend himself. That's how Roman justice worked. If you've been in Paul's position, how might you have defended yourself? It's been said that if you were uh, in court and charged with being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's the one to reflect on over lunch, perhaps. Paul begins by reassuring Felix. Do you know what they've said about me? Fundamentally, it's not true. For a start, I haven't been in Jerusalem long enough to have done all these things they've claimed that I've done. Paul then confesses his faith, Acts 24, 14. I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. There's an important verse that we could skip over, isn't it? I admit. 
Would you be willing to admit publicly with all that's at stake that you are a follower of Jesus? You think, well, I'm not going to court this week. I don't have to worry about this question. So what might be um, a similar tough place for us? Where would you find it difficult, perhaps, to admit? Because there's consequences to admitting this. But to your friends, I admit that I'm a follower of the way I worship God. Would that perhaps break the friendship or make you feel very uncomfortable as a result, make your friends uncomfortable? I admit, perhaps difficult at work. I know people tell us there's all sorts of rules and regulations about work. I admit that I worship God. Where would be a similar difficult place for us? Paul is sharing his faith in God. He, he wants people to know he's not ashamed about what he believes. He follows the same God as his opponents. He believes in the law and the prophets. Paul even has the same hope, we're told, as these men in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. I think we've said it before, but Paul's doing an important thing here, which is he does again and again. He's drawing links with his opponents. You think we're bitterly divided. You think we're like chalk, uh, chalk and cheese or whatever it is for, for negatives and positives, that sort of thing. But actually, there's quite a lot of common in here. He's reaching out, finding common ground with his opponents. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Wasn't that just what the religious rules and regulations were all about, being clear conscious before God and man? As much Paul has in common with his opponents, but he's not going to stop there. For there is a fundamental difference between Paul and his opponents. And this is the source of the difference, and this is the source of the division. Paul is a follower of the way. Whenever we find our faith on trial, whether it's uh, just in a conversation we're having over a cup of coffee or, or a more serious sort of situation, we should reach out. We should try to find areas of common agreement. But let's not stop there. Let's be very clear about where our faith is different, perhaps, to those we're in conversation with. Paul is a follower of Jesus. Early followers of Jesus were known as followers of the way. We think, well, that's a bit of a strange term. Why did they call them that? Well, it was all sorts of different reasons. Partly the way was, of course, the, the Roman roads, which you followed to find uh, the right direction to get to your destination. And then also in the Gospels, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Was it really only uh, two weeks ago? It, well, I was sort of standing up here, but I wasn't doing much talking, was I? It was the Wild Hope team were with us. It's only really 10 days or so since our mission kind of stopped uh, a week ago, wasn't it? And uh, I wonder how you found that. It's an interesting question to ask now that a few days have passed since it's finished. Did you find it a really good time or did you find it sometimes a bit of a difficult time? Uh, I think many of us were out and about, either down at the shop unit or out in the field or in different ways, and perhaps you had the privilege of being alongside some of the members of the Wild Hope team who were uh, very encouraging, but also pushed us a bit, didn't they, in terms of how we did things, encouraged us to try some new things in terms of stepping out and sharing our faith. Uh, I personally can say, I know why it's called evangelism, because it's pretty scary. You find your legs turning to jelly when suddenly you're confronted in a conversation with uh, far more than what perhaps you would usually go for. It's scary. It's, uh, it's more than asking people about, you know, what's the weather like or what are you up to today? It's turning the conversation towards Jesus. Uh, perhaps, like me, you thought, well, they turned that conversation to Jesus really quickly and now they've turned it on to me and I don't know what to say, actually. Sometimes people try to shut down the conversation. We got Jesus. That, that was not what they want to talk about, personally. They come out for something else. You were talking about Jesus. No, thanks. That's okay. Or there could be awkward silences because actually they did want to find out more. And the person, sometimes in my case, often in my case, I'll be honest, didn't know what to say next. What, you want to find out more? I don't know. <laughs> it can be a bit scary. It is scary talking to strangers about our faith. That's for sure. But uh, actually, it's a good deal more scary when it comes to friends we meet a lot or know a lot or family members who may know more about us than perhaps we'd usually confess. Whatever background we come from, Whoever we've done or whatever we've done, Jesus' words remain true. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. 
And if we want to get right with our Heavenly Father, which is our only hope in this broken world, then we need to trust Jesus as Lord and as Savior. This is the message Paul would preach. He would preach it in the synagogues. He preached it in the town halls and in the debating centers of his day. He preached it to those who thought they knew God. He preached it to his opponents and to those in power. This is the message Paul had trusted. And Jesus, uh, Paul knew that if Jesus had changed his life, then he was in turn to allow Jesus to go and change other people's lives too. There was no one too powerful, no one too opposed to him, no one too small or great who could not be transformed by the love of Jesus Christ. And your Paul's faith really ought to be our faith today. There's no one too great or too small. There's no one too opposed to us or too far away from God to know the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. So what about us this morning as we roll to an end? Are we going out of our way to avoid the way? Or are there opportunities where like Paul, albeit in a different context, we too may defend our faith and share our faith that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Shall we take a moment just to reflect on God's word to us this morning? Just let's pray for a moment, and then I'll hand back to you. Uh, to our music team to lead us in some further worship this morning. Let's say, let's just close our eyes and perhaps take a moment just to say, God, what do you actually want to say to us this morning? Who are the people we will encounter this week who don't know you yet? Who are the people we've perhaps uh, written off in terms of being able to encounter Jesus because they seem too opposed, too too brittle, too fixed in their ways. Who are those unexpected people who actually are going to help us or in different ways perhaps provide an opportunity for us? Lord, whenever we think of Jesus as the way, the truth and life, we find hope, we find assurance. But when we think of sharing it, we find fear. I pray that your Holy Spirit will help us to trust you and to find courage to not leave mission behind because we think we've done it doing that mission week, but to actually pray for people and to see lives continue to be transformed in Jesus' name. So may you bless us now as we continue to worship you this morning. Amen. We have a little video from uh, Oliver Newton, who's uh, serving in Monterey Ray Community Church in Northern Ireland. So he's, he sent us a little video, which I nearly forgot about. Apologies. So shall we watch that now? It's the caper's right all along. So uh, we can uh, we can have faith because we've got a faithful God, haven't we? So uh, we know if we step out, the person of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised to send to us as a helper goes with us, and so it makes it a little bit less scary, doesn't it? <laughs> so let's stand and sing to our faithful God and in uh, declaring his faithfulness let's receive extra faith for, uh, for whatever lies ahead whatever opportunities lie ahead for us this coming week yeah faithful one so Call out. 
So as we, uh, as the live stream comes to an end, we pray for all those watching on live stream and for us here, that our faith would build as a result of our encounter with Heavenly Father this morning. Holy Spirit, stir that faith up in us. And I pray that all those watching on live stream, as you enjoy the rest of your day, I pray that you'll go in the blessing of our Heavenly Father for the rest of the day. And pray that God would give you and us the opportunity to declare the hope that is within us with faith. Amen. 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 Keith, we're going to share now, yeah?
We've got some uh, space in the service this morning for anyone who'd like to share anything, perhaps